Hello and welcome to Indian Masterminds to yet another interview of an eminent personality. Today we have with us former Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry, Mrs. Kiran Bedi, a former bureaucrat, in fact, the first woman IPS officer of the country. She is the winner of Magsese Award for initiating and implementing prison reforms in Tihar. A stickler for rules, she is also known as Crane Bedi for enforcing strict traffic rules in Delhi, including towing away vehicles from no parking zones with cranes. It is said even a car of late Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was not spared. So don't move away and keep watching to know more interesting facts from the life of the indomitable and fearless Kiran Bedi, who has just come up with a new book aptly titled Fearless Governance. Welcome, ma'am. It's a pleasure to have you with us at Indian Masterminds. Thank you, Junali. Thank you. So did your man actually tow away a car of late Prime Minister Indira Gandhi? Yes, my sub-inspector Nirmal Singh towed it away and uh, it was a part of a collective policy. The policy was rule of law. Policy was nobody above the law. So he was following the policy instructions. And then when he towed it away, he informed me that, Madam, I've done it. I stood by him. I said, you've done what was agreed on. But none of my seniors intervened. I had a very good additional commissioner, Mr. Pillay. They did not interfere. I had another senior officer, Shok Tandon. They, none of them interfered. They let it happen because they knew it was happening before and after. Even Director CBI's vehicle was towed away. Many senior officers were being towed away, but it was the rule at that time. And the police officers were following a policy which I was fully respecting. Right. Nevertheless, we have heard that you shared uh, very good relations with Indira Gandhi as well as late Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. Yes, we had a very respectful relationship with both. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi invited me for breakfast after I did the 1975 Republic Day Parade. She was very gracious and invited me and she used to invite me even when many other VIPs used to visit and then showcased me uh, our India's first woman IPS officer. I was like a you know, presenter. I was presented as a success story. The women have come all the way. So And so was Mr. R uh, Rajiv Gandhi. He was very gracious, very nice. Right. Coming to the recent past, during your tenure as a Lieutenant Governor in Puducherry, you had opened up the Governor House Raj Nivas to the public. It was a rare gesture. So what made you do it? I opened up the Raj Nivas to people for pe to connect the Raj Nivas to connect to the common man. And the purpose of Raj Nivas was, was to serve the people. So in any way, Raj Nivas could serve the people. Otherwise, how do, you, how do you stay in a closed to serve the people? If the objective is to connect with the people, serve the people, remove their grievances, hear them out, how would you do it unless you open up the gates? So we opened up the gates for people to walk in and we had Monday to Friday, a fixed time from, uh, from five to seven, take a token and come turn by turn and sit in the lounge, get a cup of tea served by the Rajadeva staff. You will get a green tea, you will get a biscuit and wait for your turn. And then you come turn by turn. And I had these Tamil speaking personal secretary who would interpret where those people who didn't know English. And we used to record, document, and remove their grievances, hear them out. So we made uh, Rajdwas open to visitors, not only with grievances, but one to two in the afternoon, anybody visiting Pondicherry, registering themselves, they could come and visit Rajdwas, see the whole beautiful building. So we opened up to visitors and tourists, and many foreigners used to come and listen and see, uh, one to two, and then I used to meet those visitors also. They, they, they carried a lot of photographs of the artifacts. So grievances redressal and visitors. So we were promoting Raj Devas as a tour, as a place of a uh, very precious place, a destination for Puducherry. So it was marketing Puducherry and of course, making a uh, Raj Devas available for a common man. And it turned out to be the open house actually turned out to be the best because through that I came to know what was not right. 
what was wrong, and all that needed to be addressed from policy point of view, governance, transfers, services, trainings, because I used to hear officers as well. One day was dedicated to only Puducherry officers because right. they wouldn't come with others. So this was their service matter, their confirmations, their gratuities, their pensions, right? Their housing, or they had family issues. So they could come and speak to me as one Directly. of them. And fortunately, I had the I had the position and the power to help them completely. Right. You gave many young interns a chance to work with you in the governor house. Even now you hold regular webinars with young people. So in your book, you mentioned that it is very important to grow up as a responsible citizen first before becoming a leader. How do you suggest we teach our children to become responsible leaders of tomorrow? We must engage with the, engage them with community giving and community work early from school times itself. We must engage them with practical work and your new national education policies about skills development. I would say link the school that ninth standard onwards with some cause, with some cause on a regular basis, whether it's working in the fields with their families, whether it's helping their mothers at the workplace, whether it's the factory visits or it's teaching the other school, young, uh, younger children, so engage them. So if you are a 10th standard, take a class of mathematics and English and languages of second standard, third standard, fourth standard. Give them, engage them early on in giving. Once you engage the youth early on in giving, connecting, communicating, and serving, you are actually instilling those value systems. But if you only talk to them about it, but not make them practically, it's like by doing. You see, what you do, you remember. What you hear, may you may forget. But what you see, may register, may not. But what you do with your hands, you never forget. So when, when you make them do things, I, I would say if any father, any person's father is in agriculture or in horticulture, children should be encouraged to spend time with their parents in assisting them, doing, working with them. Then they will value agriculture, they will value shopkeeping, they will value small enterprise, they will uh, learn small businesses, they will learn teaching, or if our father's a doctor, be in the clinic, help the patients register. So do make them do something which is so easy. Get them into giving. Right. You also mentioned in your book that becoming an IPS officer and the governor of Puducherry was a calling. You write about hearing a voice while praying in Aurobindo Ashram, asking you to go to the governor house. We are curious to know about this voice. Was it a voice of some divine power or was it your inner voice? Inner voice is divine power. If you start listening to the inner voice, it is divinity. You just have to listen to it and recognize it. So when I was paying my obeisance at the Samadhi of the mother and Sri Aurobindo, it just came saying, go see Rajnavas. It just said, go see Rajnavas. I was surprised. I didn't know where Rajnavas was. And I had no plans. I've never visited places like these when I travel to tourism, tourism or sightseeing. So I, I had my IS friend who brought me there, Chandra Griali. I said, Chandra, where is Rajnivas? She says, right, right next door. It's next door, just one block away. So I said, can we go there? She's okay, let's go. So we went and uh, we requested the security. Chandra was uh, secretary to the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, governor of Tamil Nadu at that time. And we walked in and we went and the, we walked through the lawns and the, the, the walkway, the pathway, which I've described in the book. Mm -hmm. And then there was a wonderful statue in the right at the entrance. And it was very, it had such lovely tall trees. It was a very impressive entrance. And uh, then only uh, an additional secretary was there, Mr. Srinivas, who also became my additional secretary later when I joined. So he offered us a cup of tea. We had a little chat and we left. I don't know what happened so many years ago. I just left. I just loved the place. I felt very connected with the place, but I went on an inner calling. And then when I got this message from the prime minister, an offer to say, go work in Rajnivas, the two things clicked that I had gone to Pondicherry many years ago. I had visited the Rajnivas on her calling saying, go visit Rajnivas. Is there a relationship between my that visit and this visit, I just could not, 
I could, but I did connect the two. That's why it becomes the opening page of my book. Right. So what next? Do you hear the voice telling you to contest elections again? And from where? No, I'm not meant for electoral politics. I love administration. I'm okay. basically very good at administration, but electoral politics doesn't come into my heart. So no plans? It I doesn't said. come. There's no calling. Right. See, there's no calling. So how spiritual are you? Do you pray regularly? And how much time do you devote to praying? Remember, spirituality is not linked to a prayer. It's a prayer for life. Spirituality is not sitting in praying, but leading a life for prayer, which means goodness, which means righteousness, which means sense of giving, generosity, compassion, love, joy, sharing, right? And being worthy of and being good character. I think good deeds. That's service what spirituality is about. It's, it's service to, it's like life of gratitude. And a life, life of also uh, certainly a prayer, but I can walk and pray. I can run and pray. I may sit and pray, right? I may have my eyes open and pray. I may shut my eyes and pray. But to me, spirituality is being connected with your spirit within, being soulful, being conscious of the fact that there's some voice within you, which you're, you can listen, you can hear. That's what I do. I listen, that's another chapter in my book is when how I was preparing for the next day while listening early hours of the morning to my inner calling, inner voice. And it inner voice was guiding me to say what new ideas emerged, solutions emerged. I got truly guided within those days and I would sit in the morning and meditate. Exactly. So is this what you call by meditating in the morning? Because you get up very early in the morning, you've written in the book and start meditating. Yeah. yeah. You see, I was not an experienced lieutenant governor, but I did administer. I administered <clears throat> departments, but I never administered a state or union territory. So I did need, I needed support. I needed spiritual guidance. And I used to sit and quietly get up early in the morning and meditate. But I do know how thoughts flowed. It just came by myself. It was like a screen to say, you could do this and you can. The ideas emerged, solutions emerged, something within the insane to show me the way the right way and when i would have a good idea and i would express it in my 10 a.m meeting with the officers which is also a chapter in the book called the 10 a.m meeting it just to they used to feel very good that ma'am's coming with some be better ideas so it was like connecting with the higher consciousness when you connect with the higher conscious for the right reason and then you share it and do it spread for the larger good to me this is the larger meaning of spirituality as an IPS officer, you initiated prison reforms that got you the Magsaysay Award. What made you introduce those reforms? Were you disturbed by the conditions in Tihar jail at that point of time? If you see the Magsaysay citation, it is prison reforms is one of the reasons. They traced my 25 years of my policing career and they found a continuity a connectivity between the consistency in uh, authenticity in the way I worked. So it was, it's all about policing and prisons. And the whole policing was power of prevention. I was constantly harping on, if I'm arresting anybody as a police officer, how can I help that person to stop repeating crime? So I was doing this checking, re, uh, working on rehabilitation, even as a police officer, sending police or sending their children to school, helping their wives to earn an occupation and uh, skills development even at that time. So my whole objective at that time was to check the recycling of crime, even as a police officer. I started schools as a, as a police officer for children of uh, drug addicts so that they don't take to drugs themselves or a vocational skill for drug uh, peddlers, which are women. So my whole approach was, that's how a foundation was born. The Navjoti India Foundation was born before the Maxis Award came. So before I went to the prison, my whole approach was rehabilitative, preventive, corrective. So I used to believe in the power of correction. So when I went to the prisons, the same, the entire habit of the entire way of looking at crime was different. It was to say, how do I now make sure the 10,000 men and women who are with me, when they leave the prison, they don't come back 
by another crime. So I started education programs for them. What I was doing it in my district as a deputy commissioner of police, I expanded it as inspector general prisons. And I, then there were 10,000 people in one institution bringing in large meditation because the scale was very good. So for me, it was a all small scale to a total scale. And I think that's where it got noticed because the scale got noticed, but the, the spirit behind it was a part of my policing and my career from day one of my policing. So this is how the things, that's why the citation actually is mentioning the beat bullet boxes, the start the Navjoti India Foundation, how I started schools for children, et cetera. So it's a continuity. Maxisi Award is not one for one act. Maxisi uh, researches you whether there's a continuity of the spirit of what they're looking for, the crime, the prevention, the power of prevention. That's what they looked at. And that's how prison became the uh, cause, the immediate catalyst. When I ran a thousand, a program of meditation program for 1000 prisoners without any guns around Vipassana meditation, which became the world's largest uh, meditation program anywhere held in the world. I think that's got the, the, it is the magnitude and the size of reform, the extent of it and the impact of it, which got the attention of the Maxis Foundation. Okay. Coming to your UPSC journey, what was your rank in civil services exam and what was your preparation strategy? I have no idea what was my rank. I have no idea. I've never asked about it. But uh, what was which strategy? Was preparation generally? strategy for the exam, UPSC, CSC. Oh, I studied. I was a good student throughout. For me, it was a walk-in. It wasn't much of a preparation because I was topping the classes in uh, through, uh, scored the highest in master's in political science, Chandigarh University. And then I kept studying, but I used to study never from an examination point of view. I was always studying from a research and understanding point, the joy of, joy of learning. For me, books were joy of learning, not exams. Yet I scored very well because I was very research oriented. Then I used to spend a lot of time borrowing books from the library and researching, traveling with the books. I was a good, I was a very happy student, a very willing student. So for me, and I had started teaching after my master's, uh, taught for two years. So I took the exam while teaching. So I didn't retire out to study and take an off to pray. For me, it was a continuity of um, uh, leaving my master's, leaving at the best of the subjects in the, and then teaching for two years and then uh, uh, alongside preparing for my exams. So it was not taking off. In fact, I was working working as a lecturer in political science in Amritsar College, Khalsa College for Women Amritsar. I was teaching political science to graduate students when I scored and made into the Indian police service. So I was on the job from one lectureship now to the Indian police service. In fact, you know, ma'am, yesterday I watched your, one of your webinars on Twitter with young uh, students. So all of them uh, were you are asking them question one by one. And so uh, basically, it's, is it a way of developing you know, leadership skills? That's true. It's about grooming leadership. Right. So it that's is what I'm nice. investing right myself, using this book to groom leadership now, saying, read this chapter, ask me questions. So it's I'm making them read mm. and then ask, making them read and think. Mm. You see? So when you, if you, how do you think if you don't read? Yes. So you read, trigger, think, and ask. Yes, and but you're all about leadership. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am, from all of us at Indian Masterminds. So that was Mrs. Kiran Bedi doing some straight talking as always. Hope you enjoyed getting to know her a bit more closely. To know her even better, read her book, Fearless Governance. And especially don't miss it if you want to hone your leadership skills. This is the book. You can find you it in about this book. Yes, this yeah. is the book, Fearless Governance. You can find it in bookstores or you can even buy online on Amazon and Kinder. And it's in color. It's got a lot of color pictures and many other documents you can go and see. It's a, actually a four in one. It's got a QR code and uh, it has a video in it. It has the videos you can go to, documents you can see, the news clippings which I'm referring to and a lot more photo gallery. So every chapter in the end has a QR code. So what could not go into that chapter in writing, but could be still be very relevant for your interest. So it's one of the first of its kind in India, which every chapter has a specific QR code, which has videos, snippets, news clippings, documents, and blogs, etc. 
it's very convenient for readers. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you for thank watching you. Indian Masterminds.